when speaking of money and politics, I feel like we've reached sort of a uh, what I think my understanding is a unique epoch sort of in in history in that uh, capitalism has been conflated with democracy. Now that was not always the case. There there was a pretty solid understanding, particularly around the time of the first Gilded Age and even up through the New Deal, that capitalism could be and often was at odds with democracy. Do you have any insight to offer in terms of how we've gotten to this point where capitalism seems to equate democracy and a good business person equates a, a good civic leader, a good politician. Well, that's when you have a you know a propaganda system and a well-functioning media, which you know is really an echo chamber uh, for the rich and the powerful that have been uh, promoting that line that capitalism and democracy are simultaneously that people have a choice. You know, go into you know any uh, supermarket or grocery store and the twenty-seven brands of toothpaste. You can make that choice. Uh, but I think these are, you know, very false choices. Well, first of all, you know, we really don't even have capitalism in this country. We have a kind of state capitalism, mm. which uh, can produce on demand uh, bailouts for the rich and powerful when they get into trouble, uh, tax breaks and tax loopholes and uh, subsidies and all kinds of uh, benefits that are extended to the ruling class. I think we should use that term um, you know, it's uh, uh, it's fallen out of fashion as socialism has fallen out of fashion. It's been, you know, smeared and besmirched uh, with the uh, Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. But I think these issues are you know, so fundamental. Uh, and it was Justice uh, Louis Brandeis, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, who said uh, many years ago, we're talking over a century ago, I think. Uh, he said that you can have great concentrations of wealth or you can have democracy. Uh, you can't have both. And I think Justice Brandeis was spot on. That's, that's what we have. We have great concentrations of wealth. We have a faux democracy where, you know, we have these uh, ritualistic, hollowed-out uh, elections every two and four years where mostly the candidate with you know who commands uh, capital uh, wins the election but even then there's there's just very little daylight between the republicans and the democrats you know i'll use that ralph ter ralph nader term again very little daylight mostly it's on social issues uh you know gay marriage and and, and that kind of thing mm -hmm. but when it comes to fundamental issues of how the economy operates and what the United States is doing around the world with its imperialistic, aggressive foreign policy, there's very little difference. Well, I say, well, what is the difference? The extreme, you know, I mean, the Republican Party now, and I know you're in a state where, you know, which has a history of uh, so-called independent uh, Republican representatives, particularly mm -hmm. uh, in the Senate. Uh, has gone so far to the right that it's 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 truly breathtaking. We're talking about you know uh, a party that was once. I mean, I remember uh, the Republicans in in the 1960s. The Republicans of um, I'm from New York, so you know Nelson Rockefeller and Jacob Javits and Kenneth Keating and uh, George Aiken in Vermont and Leverett Saltonstall in. Uh, Massachusetts, Edward Brooke in um, Massachusetts. If those people were alive today, even uh, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, mm -hmm. they would have no place in the Republican Party, uh, and nor in the Democratic Party. That's how far the political spectrum has shifted to the right. I mean, if Eisenhower were around today, he'd be regarded as a as a crank, as an absolute lunatic who you know warned the country of a military industrial. Uh, complex and what that portended. Well, you know, if he were again, if you were to if you were to look around today, he wouldn't recognize the United States, which is the most you know number one weapon seller in the world, uh, the number one you know military power that has, uh, according to Chalmers Johnson, almost 800 military bases uh, around the world. And that seems to be a conservative figure because there are many more uh, military, in what they call installations, that are not even counted as uh, Pentagon uh, bases. 
So, you know, the, the, what's happened uh, uh, politically is there's been this huge shift to the right, uh, not by accident. Uh, the, six, the 60s scared uh, the ruling class uh, in this country. People were out of control. Students were out of control. Negroes were out of control. Uh, Puerto Ricans, American Indians, women, women mm-hmm. uh, all were demanding uh, rights, demanding to be heard, demanding a seat at the table. And so there was a concerted, organized campaign, not something haphazard. Uh, you, I just refer you to the Powell Memorandum mm-hmm. of uh, 1971. Uh, Lewis Powell, who was a, a lobbyist for the tobacco industry and uh, was later appointed to the Supreme Court by Richard Nixon, uh, he wrote this uh, memorandum uh, for the Chambers of Commerce in the United States saying, we're losing control of the country. Uh, we've got to do something about it. And so that's when they decided to you know, start a lot of these. A lot of these think tanks were funded then. Uh, they, they paid particular and uh, very sharp attention to media, to uh, owning the media, to acquiring radio stations and newspapers and magazines and TV stations uh, and the like, to roll back the gains of the 1960s and uh, early 1970s. And they've largely succeeded in, in doing that. I mean, the Occupy movement was a break in that k- kind of monochromatic one-note samba of uh, mm-hmm. obedience and conformity. Uh, and I think now the Black Lives Matter movement is also another break. But, you know, we need to sustain these movements. We need to fight power, uh, not from above, but from below, with mass organizations that can move move the culture uh, back. So I, I'm not going to say we're going to recover our democracy. I, I don't know that we've ever really had a genuine democracy uh, in this country. But where there is more uh, in a, more equality, uh, economic as well as political. Mm. Well, you know, it's funny you say that. I was I was about to mention, you know, the the democracy that. Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson sought to create in America was admittedly significantly limited, but it was it was founded on this idea of an informed and engaged electorate and and populace, and that that's that was understood to sort of be essential for a functioning democracy. Of course, around the turn of the century, you had figures like Edward Bernays and Walter Lippmann uh, and others who ushered in the era of modern public relations, which they then called rather honestly, propaganda, and which is specifically designed and implemented to engineer the consent of a disparate and far-flung populace. Of course, Noam Chomsky has written uh, a lot about this, which is great. So, my, you know, my question is, if, if, if it's that engineering of consent that has sort of pulled, peeled people away from the democratic process and sort of pacified them and allowed the drift to the right that has occurred in this in this country first of all is it second of all um who do we hold responsible for that and how do we hold them responsible for that those are really good questions um first off i don't think it's a drift to the right you know i I think it's like a full-blown hurricane Mm. um and you know we see that particularly with the decline in union membership something i alluded to uh, earlier with the attack on unions uh, I remember in the 1950s that you know union membership was in the 30 percent, 34, 35 percent. Today it's down to single digits, and that's had had that's had mm. profound effects right across the uh, political and economic uh, spectrum. Now, I know a lot is made of the Founding Fathers, and you mentioned uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Paine is not in that group, but, you know, even Tom Paine, if he were writing today, he couldn't get, he couldn't, he couldn't get on an NPR radio station, for example. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Why? Because they would have to balance whatever he said with comments from King George. <laughs> right. Uh, um, uh, this is, uh, uh, I say this because my own program, which is produced in Boulder, Colorado, Uh, has just been removed from uh, an NPR affiliate because, quote, it's not objective or uh, balanced. 
Hmm. See, this is something that, uh, you know, the, the mass media and now increasingly NPR and PBS hide, befo- hide behind. They need a so-called a balance. And, of course, objectivity is a very subjective uh, term itself. But when you talk, you know, Jefferson said information is the uh, cornerstone of democracy. You know, without information, you have largely uh, an ignorant population. I'm paraphrasing him. Mm -hmm. But the founding fathers have a very mixed record, um, not just for obvious reasons of slave owning and uh, grotesque racism uh, toward uh, the indigenous population, the Native American uh, peoples in this country, uh, you know, misogyny rampant, Etc. And you know you have some some comments like from um, James Madison, you know, who's often held up as one of the most you know the brightest and uh, the, one of the most brilliant of the of the founders, and who, who largely wrote the Federalist Papers and mm-hmm. uh, two time president and etc. Uh, he said the aim of government is to protect the opulent minority against the majority. I'll say that again. James Madison, the aim of government is to protect the opulent minority against the majority. Mm. And then his colleague, John Jay, who became the first Supreme, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and uh, he was the president of the Constitutional Convention, he said those who own the country ought to govern it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have those kinds of uh, uh, tendencies as well uh, in the uh, political uh, system. Now, the propaganda that you talked about, uh, you know, that really develops uh, in a dramatic way during World War I, when the U.S. population was largely against uh, going uh, to war uh, in Europe. And incidentally, it's been revealed by no less than uh, Chris Hedges that uh, there was a Wall Street influence in uh, pushing Wilson toward uh, declaring war against Germany and sending troops uh, to Europe. Because by uh, 1917, uh, the German army had made major advances. Uh, Russia had just collapsed. The uh, communist Bolshevik revolution had just taken place. So Russia was out of the equation as a military force. And it looked at the time that uh, France and Britain would be defeated by uh, Germany. Now, how does this affect Wall Street and U.S. policy and U.S. Uh, entry into the war? Into the war, Wall Street banks had lent France and Britain huge amounts of money, and if they had lost the war, there was no chance of that money being repaid mm. with interest uh, to those banks. So that's a you know a kind of economic uh, issue. Now the that was totally sub rosa, uh, and what's happening. Uh, at the time, is that the Creel Commission, the Committee on Public Information, George Creel was a journalist at the time, uh, he recruited uh, Edward Bernays, who's called the father of modern propaganda, someone who uh, Hitler spoke very highly of, uh, and in an admiring way in, in Mein Kampf, not by name, but by w- the, the work that uh, this committee did during the war to, to do what? to move the American population from uh, being a neutral and uh, p- pacifist to being uh, actively uh, demanding a U.S. intervention uh, in the war. And so they produced uh, uh, war films and posters, uh, you know, bogus stories were uh, circulated about uh, German atrocities, babies being thrown in the air and uh, bayoneted by by German troops. <coughs> Excuse me. And so that galvanized. It had an effect. It galvanized uh, the population uh, to uh, support uh, the war effort. That was the beginning. That was the uh, kind of the base of uh, what became a very very sophisticated uh, system of uh, indoctrination and, and propaganda. The manufacture of consent, as Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky point out in their book by that same title. 
Yeah, you touched on uh, Wall Street's role in sort of um, moving the country to war in World War One, and you know that sort of segues into uh, something I'd like to ask you about. Uh, Dr. John Cobb, who's a theologian and environmentalist, is quoted as saying, "Today's global economy is fully transnational. The money power is not much interested in boundaries between states." and generally works to reduce their influence on markets and investments. Thus, transnational corporations inherently work to undermine nation states, whether they are democratic or not. So we're we're seeing this this sort of conflict between um, transnational capital, right, and popular movements like, say, Syriza um, in Greece, uh, and then Podemos, which is rising uh, in Spain. Um, but of course, Syriza has been hamstrung by the international banks, and they they have been unable to deliver on the promises that they campaigned on. Where is this heading? Where is this conflict heading? Well, nothing lasts forever. And, uh, you know, this current arrangement of uh, power and privilege also will not last. Uh, it is, you know, I think... Uh, almost inherently uh, self-destructing. First of all, with its unrelenting war on nature, uh, the eco-crisis that, that the planet is facing uh, is becoming worse and worse. Uh, the California drought uh, is just the tipping point of multiple such issues around the world. I spend time in South Asia and West Asia where there are enormous areas that are water stressed. Uh, the rising temperatures, 2014, hottest year on record. So I think the, the eco issue, uh, the climate change issue, is, is going to be a game changer because business cannot continue as usual if the store you're operating in is burning down or is melting. Uh, that's, you know, one, one thing that I, I think I can say with uh, some confidence. The Greek situation is, is really interesting. Yes, as you pointed out, uh, Syriza made uh, many promises and was, you know, cheering on. Uh, but they're up against this troika of the International Monetary Fund, the uh, European Central Bank, and the European Union, which has lent... Uh, millions and millions of uh, euros uh, to, Gre- to Greece to sustain uh, itself, to sustain its economy. It's, a, it's probably um, Greece and Portugal, I believe, rank as the poorest of, uh, among the poorest of the uh, EU uh, members. There's a bad joke going around uh, in Greece today uh, to the effect that what the German Wehrmacht was unable to achieve uh, during in the 1940s, the Bundesbank uh, has done uh, today successfully. Mm-hmm. Uh, Germany is calling the shots. Uh, there's uh, tremendous resentment against uh, G- the Germans uh, for their occupation, but also for their very punitive and harsh uh, austerity program, which they've you know imposed on on the Greek people which has caused uh, enormous suffering. Uh, Many people have committed suicide. This is like one of these untold stories of, you know, elderly people who have lost their pensions. So the the human cost of this kind of rapacious, uh, unfeeling, insensitive uh, capitalism is simply uh, enormous and is very hard to uh, measure. Uh, What's happening, I think, also in in Spain can be very positive. It looks like uh, they may Podemos may may in fact win uh, the election coming up uh, in August. They they have uh, quite a bit of uh, popular uh, support. But to address the climate issue, hmm. uh, this currently constructed economic system cannot do it because it's it's based on. On profits, it's based on extraction of natural resources, be it iron ore or uh, bauxite or coal or oil, natural gas. 
uh, all of these things. Uh, this is an institutional imperative of the system. It has to maximize profits. Mm -hmm. So we can only save the planet if we change the system and act collectively. So, you know, there's, I don't know if you know about the case of Bhutan, a small little landlocked uh, country uh, in the Himalayas in, in South Asia. It has a very enlightened political leadership. Uh, they've actively moved to reduce their carbon footprint. They've even, uh, they are even discouraging tourism, which had been a, a major source of uh, uh, national income, uh, in order to, you know, have a uh, more compatible and compassionate relationship with Mother Nature. But that's a small state with fewer than a million people living in it. We need global collective action in order to be effective. So you can't have, you know, a one-off, you know, let's say Bhutan, or, or then, you know, that's followed by Sikkim, and maybe Ecuador will do something, and then maybe the Ivory Coast or Benin will uh, enact an enlightened eco uh, program. It has to be global, and it cannot be based on the current existing state capitalist models. Hmm. Yeah, so, you know, it's we seem to be seeing rumblings uh, from the left, both globally, such as Syriza and Podemos, but also in America. I mean, uh, Emmanuel, Rahm Emanuel in Chicago just had to have the first runoff election in Chicago's history and and uh, uh, against Chuy Garcia, who who ultimately lost the, the runoff. But, um, but he was forced to be held accountable in a way that uh, would, was unlikely to have occurred previously in Chicago's history, and then Bill de Blasio's election and the movements for some uh, candidates a little bit further to the left. Of course, my, my question is this. There are those that say, well, there's the other side of that coin, right? And so, for example, if Syriza fails in Greece or Podemos, let's say they win and they're unable to deliver to the people, uh, there are the equivalent movements on the right, which are uh, hard and fascistic that could just as easily sort of rise to power. And of course, Chris Hedges has spoken quite eloquently about how the apparatus exists, the mechanism exists in America right now for a totalitarian state. Should should we elect the wrong person and they choose to flip the switch? So to what degree are we responsible for staving that outcome off? And to what degree do you think we should realistically be concerned about it? Well, to the last part of your question, we should be very, very concerned about it. The, the rise of uh, fascism and totalitarianism uh, is not theoretical. It's something very real. If anyone had any doubts about that, uh, we have to thank uh, the courageous work of uh, Edward Snowden mm. and uh, Glenn Greenwald and others and Laura Poitras who have amplified uh, Snowden's message as well as Julian Assange and uh, WikiLeaks. Uh, we have seen the growth of the national security state, which is a really a kind of deep state. It is a state within a state. It is, it is not answerable. I think one of the most laughable things that everyone should just like break out into paroxysms of laughter is when they hear about congressional intelligence oversight committees. Mm. Uh, this is not only redundant, it's a total oxymoron. Uh, there is virtually no oversight of these 16 uh, intelligence agencies, so-called, that we have that command enormous black budgets in the tens of billions of dollars, maybe even hundreds of billions of dollars uh, at this point. The growth of a huge uh, bureaucracy, the Department of Homeland Security and the notorious uh, TSA, which everyone encounters at, uh, at their airports. You know what TSA stands for, Eric? Thousands standing around. Uh, you know, you go there, I don't know about you, but here in Denver, you know, when I go to the airport, there are usually all of these officers just standing around, you know, with their hands folded, I guess, looking at people who are yawning too much. Uh, that apparently is one of the tip-offs mm -hmm. for a possible terrorist uh, passing through the screening system. 
Uh, I'm not making this up. There was a, a recent document that the Intercept revealed uh, that had yawning down as one of the one of the clues that uh, TSA staff should be looking for when they're monitoring the uh, passengers trying to get on on their uh, flights. So we have an enormous increase in uh, centralized power and centralized power that is acting in secret, which is totally contrary to any idea of uh, democratic uh, accountability and would dri- again it, you know I, I use the term you use the word you know drifting but it's you know it's more than a drift uh, there's a powerful move uh, to the right I mean you've got you know people in the Congress now that are absolutely scary like Tom cotton of uh, Arkansas uh, Ted Ted Rubio uh, uh, Cruz, um, Ted Cruz uh, and Marco Rubio. Mar- Marco Rubio, yeah. yes, thank you. Marco mm-hmm. Rubio and, and uh, Ted Cruz and uh, many others. Uh, this is, I think, a really scary moment. So to the question of what's our responsibility, our responsibility is enormous. Are we going to be uh, what was called uh, in the 30s and 40s good Germans and just look away and worry about the latest Kardashian divorce or uh, you know, Hollywood scandal or, you know, how my particular sports team is doing and, you know, will Peyton Manning uh, lead the Denver Broncos to the uh, Super Bowl finally uh, and who should who should the Yankees draft uh, number one when, they, when their number comes up? Should we focus on those kinds of things or about uh, real issues? And that's why I call the, the, the corporate media in particular – uh, a weapon of mass distraction. And that's why we need stations like WMPG. We need programming uh, productions like Alternative Radio, and people can find out more by going to alternativeradio.org and see all these programs. We're trying to combat this tidal wave of uh, you know right-wing fascistic totalitarianism with information, with things that people can do to fight the power, and we have an enormous responsibility S- still as citizens of a society that has the trappings of uh, democracy, uh, some aspects of it, but has, w- but has been largely eviscerated under the weight of money and corporate power. Yeah, we're big believers here at the Soapbox in in critical discourse and the importance of critical discourse as well. And that's what we try to promote. um, And and that's why we're also fans of alternative radio. Um, And you sort of took... I wish uh, MPG would uh, broadcast the program. It would be great. That's that's a great point. Yeah. Um, You kind of took my final question right out of my mouth. Um, I... I wanted to kind of hark back real quick to what you said about NPR, that one NPR station sort of pulling you off of their programming. Oh, let me give you a litany of just of things that have happened recently with uh, NPR affiliates, even community radio affiliates. Well, one station took us off the air and replaced us with a cooking show. Mm. I guess, you know, <laughs> that's cutting edge. People need to know how to cook. How many, tab- how many tablespoons of olive oil to put in their pasta? Mm-hmm. Uh, another station uh, took us off and, and replaced us with a uh, talking pets show. Oh. So you can call in and find out, you know, how your dog is doing and how your cat's doing. It's not, I'm not against pets. I like pets. <laughs> I love cats, by the way. But, um, you know, the kind of thing that alternative radio does is unique. Uh, and we are under increasing attack uh, from this kind of uh, mentality that hides behind false notions of objectivity and uh, balance and has completely turned its back on the founding document for public radio and TV in the United mm-hmm. States, which is the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967, which says that you know radio and TV should be a forum for debate, should give voice to the and a forum for controversy and should give voice to those in the community who may otherwise be unheard Mm -hmm. and so you know when alternative radio features uh, Noam Chomsky and Michael Parenti and Vandana Shiva and Tariq Ali and Arundhati Roy and Richard Wolf and Chris Hedges you know these are voices that are not in the mainstream 
that need to be heard and urgently heard, and are the space for dissent is increasingly shrinking in the United States, and we've seen that with mm. uh, you know radio stations as well as TV stations as well. Well, the media is sort of fetishization of balance and objectivity, so-called balance and objectivity, is something that makes no sense to me. And I had this conversation with Amy Goodman as well. And we used the example of climate change where like, you know, okay, so uh, an objective reporting of climate change apparently means you have someone who says it exists and someone who says it doesn't. Well, of course, that does not accurately reflect the consensus of the scientific community. Um, and so I'm hearing you say that you're not super concerned about this perception that maybe alternative radio is one-sided or uh, you represent one per perspective. Not at all. We're filling a, a gap that needs to be filled of voices and perspectives that are systematically, not randomly, systematically excluded from access to the airwaves and to uh, major magazines and uh, newspapers. Uh, I, earlier I mentioned, you know, if Tom Paine were writing, around, uh, writing today, uh, what, what would these station managers and program directors and editors of newspapers and magazines, uh, would, what would they say? Well, we need, we need to balance Tom Paine out with, you know, a comment from King George. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, right now, uh, in the next uh, few days, I'm going to be going to Turkey. It's the centenary of the uh, genocide of the Armenians, where about 1.5 million Armenians were uh, killed in uh, 1915. Uh, the Turkish government officially denies the genocide. They said it didn't happen. And so what are you going to do as a, as a person of conscience, as a, as a person who uh, understands you know, history and, and, and real objectivity. Are you to give voice to a state that denies a crime that is so well documented, that is so unambiguous and clear? Uh, I think, you know, it, it really po poses uh, a moral dilemma. It should not. I don't think time should be given to uh, that kind of uh, perspective. Well, the show is Alternative Radio. You can find it uh, online, alternativeradio.org. And the man, the host, David Barsamian, thank you so much, David. This has really been a wonderful conversation. Pleasure to be on the soapbox with you, uh, Eric, and I uh, hope to be on again.